Hey, so thanks for coming back after yesterday, um, <laughs> which was awesome, I know. And um, so, okay, so today I promised I was going to talk about super tile methods, so I'm going to do that today. Um, I thought, uh, oh, here we go. So let's, uh, let's, let's recall from yesterday um, the objects that we're dealing with are sequences on a finite alphabet. Um, and uh, tilings on a finite prototile set are the basic, the basic objects. Um, and if you want to think of them as a quasi-crystal model, then um, you can think of them as sort of the atoms. Uh, we had the big ball topology, right? Two, two objects were close if they agreed up to a small translation, maybe, on a large ball around the origin. Um, and uh, so, so sort of the way I think about it is if I'm in the tiling and I'm looking around, I'm standing at the origin, I'm looking around, I can see near me. Not so great about seeing far away. Um, so if I want to see far away, I just shift things in, and that's why our action is translation. Or the shift if you're in. Um, and, and so we want to have, um, and in, we want to have interesting tilings and sequences to deal with. And so um, periodic stuff, even if it's only periodic in one direction, is less interesting. Um, and so a good way to get interesting tilings that have a lot of structure but aren't periodic is to use what I'm calling super tile construction techniques. Um, okay, so there's symbolic substitutions. A lot of people have talked about those already um, during, during our time here. There's, there's um, constant length ZD substitutions I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about self-similar and self-affine tilings and sort of like a subclass of, that are called pseudo-self-similar. Um, I'm going to talk about fusion rules. Um, which include s -adic systems, and I'm going to show how that works. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. All right, so a substitution. So A is still our finite alphabet. I'm in the symbolic case, one-dimensional. Um, and a substitution is going to be a map that goes from A to A star, where A star is the set of non-empty finite words on A. Um, <clears throat> so you've got any old map there, and then so if you've got some, some, whoops, some finite word, then you substitute it by just literally concatenating the substituted letters from the word. I think your was already, everybody was talking about this already. Um, I'm calling them, I'm not, I'm not sure about this terminology. In, for tilings, you call them super tiles, so I thought maybe we would call it an N super word a word that's just a letter that's been substituted n times. It doesn't have special powers or anything. <laughs> um, so, okay, so here's like just the really basic example. I decided to make a constant length substitution on two, a two-letter alphabet, and I decided the length would be three. Um, and I, I want to point out, there seems to be a whole other universe of talking about this where you say things like three automatic and iterated morphisms, and that sort of thing. Am I echoing very strangely? <laughs> Is there a way to make that not happen? OK. It sounds weird. Um, OK, well. Um, and then I also threw in a little example of a non-constant length substitution. So here A, again, two letters. I don't need much. A can go to A, B, 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 and B can go to A. 
Um, so let's just, so if I start with an A and I substitute once, I get A, B, B, B. And then I've sort of I've put some spaces in just so that you can see. So you've got your A is replaced with this, and then there's three Bs that each get replaced with an A. And then I take these seven letters and substitute each of them according to the rule, concatenating as I go. Is everybody like really solid on this? <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so you, make it, you can make a subshift associated with a substitution um, <clears throat> in at least, well, in the two ways that I talked about last time, but let's just, let's just take a set, just take all the set, the set of all words that are n super words and use it kind of like a language. Um, so a sequence is said to be admitted by, um, by the substitution if every subword that you see in it um, looks like a piece of one of these guys. All right, and so I'll make a sum shift as the set of all sequences admitted by the substitution. And I'm, I'm using the word language. I know that, that you guys probably, there's probably some actual meaning of that, but um, I'm using that as shorthand. So, and if you think about it, um, if I have a sequence that's been admitted by a substitution, then if I shift it, it's not gonna change that because all the words are still the same. They're just in a different place. So that means that when I take the set of all admitted words, it will be shift invariant. And then you do a little bit of work to prove that it's closed and you're all set and you've got a subshift. All right, so that's the, that's the one dimensional case with which uh, many of us are familiar. Okay, so let's go one dimensional. Let's get some geometry in there. So um, I figured I'd do an example that goes with the non-constant length substitution that I already had. Um, all right, so I wanna, make a, I wanna make a tiling for this substitution. And so last time I talked about the fact that you can take a symbolic sequence and turn it into a tiling by just choose, you know, choose tile lengths for each of your um, letters of your alphabet. And so uh, you kind of wanna choose your letters artfully, you wanna choose your lengths artfully. So, so I need, so remember that tiles in one dimension are intervals that carry a label, so I'll choose the lengths of the intervals and then they'll just be labeled by A or B uh, depending, and I'm just using absolute value to denote the length of T sub A and T sub B. Um, and I want to define a tile substitution, and it's going to go like this. So the substitution on the A tile is going to be an A tile followed by three copies of the B tile. Um, and they'll have to have been translated, which is why I didn't write T sub A, T sub B, T sub B, T sub B. Um, and S of T sub B is just going to be T sub A. All right. And, um, and so obviously the lengths would be uh, for A, you know, whatever the length of A was, plus three times whatever the length of B was, and the length of the substituted B tile is just whatever the length of A is. So the ideal situation from a sort of a geometric standpoint is that there would be some kind of inflation factor, which tends to be called lambda, um, so that when you substitute the A tile, it's just a rescaling or an inflation of A, and when you substitute the B tile, it's a rescaling of the B tile by the same amount. So it's pretty easy to get the, the right tile lengths in this situation, right? Because I want, I want this to be true, but I also want that to be true, and I want this to be true, but I want that to be true, and you just, you just write it down and you get um, a quadratic polynomial, which is very easy to solve. Um, and so it turns out that the lambda that you want is this number right here. Um, and 
T sub A will be lambda and T sub B will be one. And it's really the ratio between the tile lengths that matters, not, not the actual tile lengths. So one of them could be one. All right, so um, the symbolic substitution becomes what we call an inflate and subdivide rule or maybe an inflation rule. Um, so if this is the A tile, so it's longer, it's like one plus root 13 over two, um, you inflate it by lambda, and then you break it up into A, B, 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 right? And the B tile, I blow it up, and then when I subdivide it, it just becomes the A tile, right? Um, does it make sense? Do you believe that you could do this for any, if somebody gave you a symbolic substitution, do you believe you could find the tile lengths if you wanted them? So uh, there's a way to do it. Uh, I don't want to get into it right now, but hopefully you at least believe me that you always can. Um, OK, so the general situation, you get yourself a symbolic substitution of any sort um, on any number of symbols. You get the right tile sizes. You define the substitution to be, um, and you get your lambda and you define your substitution to be, um, to be the patch of tiles in the order specified by sigma of E, and you support it on lambda times whatever the support of T sub E is. Um, and in general, we use the terminology inflate and subdivide rule. All right, so what does it mean to be a self-similar tiling? All right, well, suppose, so substitution can act on tilings via this, this multiplication factor lambda. So if I take any tiling in the full tiling space um, and I take any tile out of that tiling, then when I go to substitute the tile, um, it'll be the patch given by this, the substitution of that tile type um, occupying whatever the support of T was multiplied by lambda and chop it up in the place that it is. Yes? You have to figure it out. Well, yeah, it goes with the sub. So you have to start with a symbolic substitution and get get the sizes from it, and you have to do a little work. Well, we're in one dimension, so they're just going to be intervals. So two dimensions is coming in a few minutes. <laughs> it's a lot harder. <laughs> Um, okay, so if I want to apply the substitution, I can actually make the substitution into a map on the entire um, tiling space. On the whole, on the on the full tiling space, I can make it if I want to. Um, <clears throat> just by, if I want to substitute a tile, tiling, I just substitute each individual tile by, you know, blowing it up by lambda and then chopping it up according to whatever my substitution was. And here in bold face, there will be a fixed point. Ah, maybe there will be a periodic point most of the time. And, um, but let's just pretend it's fixed and um, I call it a self-similar tiling. All right, so I made a picture. So I showed this picture before. So pretend the origin is right here at the left end point. And they're not really, they don't really have thickness. I just have drawn them with <laughs> thickness for you to see. Um, and so this goes with my ABBB tiling. So imagine if I were to have inflated by the lambda that I showed you, I would get this bigger, 
These are the inflated tiles. And this one would also have the origin right here, right? If I'm just, if I'm just expanding everything by multiplying by lambda, the origin stays where it was. And so look what happens. These guys are actually perfectly aligned with this laying right on top of um, this. And so when I go to subdivide it, I'm actually right back where I started. So this thing, this thing is a fixed point at least off to the right. So each tile, you blow it up by the lambda I showed you, and you subdivide, and you're right back to where you started. So that's what a self-similar tiling is. And it's gonna work like that in higher dimensions also. There's gonna be a linear map that expands all the tiles in the tiling, and then you chop it up, and it lays perfectly upon itself. <coughs> It's not easy to make happen, but you can make it happen sometimes. All right, so here S of T equals T, and so this tiling would be called a self-similar tiling. All right. Okay, so let's go in a different direction. Let's go, um, let's go with symbolic substitutions, but in higher dimensions. Okay, so there's a little bit of geometry, but I'm gonna minimize it by uh, making the substitution constant length. Um, okay, so the goal, I wanna construct some kind of substitutions um, in ZD. So I want to, I'm gonna pick a rectangle size or a rectangular block. Um, and all the letters are gonna be substituted by a block that size. And so they'll all fit together, you can concatenate, it'll be easy. Um, so, so you choose uh, lengths for all the sides, it doesn't have to be square, it can be a rectangle, um, and just make sure all the lengths are bigger than one so that the thing expands. Um, and then, I, this is notation, I'm using this notation because it's in published work, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't love the notation, but call the location set. So this is the place, this is like an empty rectangle waiting to be filled up with the different symbols uh, for each letter. And the substitution is gonna be a map from the alphabet crossed this location set, right? So every letter and every element in the location set is going to get a letter. Um, It'll be better when I do the example. <laughs> um, and I'm calling it a, so the substitution of any given letter is gonna be called a one super block or one super tile, but let's do the example. So this is a, a sort of a variation on the Tui Morris, uh, well I'm in France so I should say Pruhe, Pruhe Tui Morris sequence. Um, so it's a two dimensional version. So you let L1 and L2 both be two, so you just have a square and the location set, if you really wanted to, you could go back to the last slide and verify. Um, and just define the substitution like this. Obviously my alphabet is zero and one. Um, and just, just define it like that. So uh, it's, there's not gonna be any trouble iterating it. If you start with a zero, you replace with what the zero was, and then each of the zeros you replace with their appropriate rules. And each of the ones that are on the diagonal you replace the way they're supposed to be. And I've just put these, this line is just there to help you see the super tiles better. Um, and then if you then iterate again each symbol with its two by two array, you would get this. Um, and so now these are one super tiles, these the four quadrants, and these are two super tiles because they've been blown up twice or super blocks or super words or whatever you'd like. All right. Okay. Um, and if you want, you can see the substitution in this scenario as a matrix of maps instead of um, instead of individual substitutions. And if you do that for the um, if you do that for the um, 
Tui Morris, and if you call G1 the match, map that switches and G0 is the identity, then, then the substitution I just showed you looks like this as a map. Um, you probably don't need that. And, um, and this thing is called bijective. This substitution is called bijective because all of the maps in all of the locations are all bijections. So uh, this has a lot of significance in terms of the dynamics of the, um, of the system because uh, it doesn't have coincidences. So hopefully I'll be able to talk about that um, when I do, when I talk about spectral theory, which apparently, hopefully will happen next time. We'll see. Um, Ah, yes, right. So if you, if you know about coding sequences and substitutions, uh, then this slide will matter to you maybe, and otherwise you should ignore it. Um, but you can make a, you can see the whole scenario as a skewed product over an odometer, like a multi-dimensional odometer, if none of what I'm saying makes any sense to you, ignore it. But if, you, if it does make sense to you, then you can kind of use these maps to make a co-cycle and, and uh, discover things about the, the spectrum and so forth. Okay, and the definition in general for a bijective substitution is just that all the PKs are bijections. I probably didn't. Okay, all right, so now let's get to the, um, the hard one. So self-similar and self-affine tilings in RD. Okay, so get yourself a finite prototile set. So remember the prototiles, they're topological disks that have labels on them. Um, and if you're lucky, the shapes, the geometry are such that you'll be able to make an inflation rule um, on your prototile set. So the idea would be that somehow you can take unions of the prototiles and create um, either similar copies, expanded copies of the prototiles, or maybe related by an expanding linear map. Um, and there's two, two ways to formally define it, one that looks like substitution and one that looks more like a fixed point idea. So the, this one is the original one. Um, and so I'm gonna show you both because uh, they're both useful. So suppose you have, for, it, uh, the diagonalizability is, is not always important, um, but get yourself an expanding linear transformation um, all of its eigenvalues are going to be bigger than one. Um, so tiling is going to be called self-affine. Uh, the tiling is on this prototile set that we've fixed. Um, if for each tile in the tiling, when you expand its support by the linear map, it sits on top of the smaller tile. So remember the one-dimensional picture I showed you a few moments ago? That one, you had the large tiles sitting perfectly on top. That's what we, that's what we want here in higher dimensions. And, um, and, then it, and then you need that if two tiles are the same type, right, so if they're equivalent up to translation, then when you expand their supports, the patches they sit on top of are the same. Well, translations of each other, right, so. So if the, um, if the map, the expanding map is a similarity, you call it a self-similar tiling. If it's just uh, an expanding linear map, you call it self-affine. Um, and a lot of times in two dimensions, you can get yourself an expanding constant um, that you can use in a similar way to the one-dimensional case. All right, so the other way to think about it is more, so, so that's, the, the thing that's weird about that definition for me is that you have to already have the self-similar tiling in hand, and then you sort of go, oh, this one's self-similar. Whereas if you, you can also think about it as a substitution, 
um, if you want to do it this way. So in this case, um, you've got some, you've still got a linear map, same deal. Um, but this time you're going to define basically a tiling substitution like we did in one dimension, um, where you, uh, you, you take your prototiles, so it's a map on all the prototiles, and so when you blow up the prototile, whoops, when you blow up your prototile, you get the support of whatever patch you assigned it to in P star, right? So this, the um, expanded tile has the same support as the patch of tiles it's sitting on top of, right? So they're geometrically related that way. So we can um, extend the substitution to tiles. So if I have a tile that's a translate of a prototile, then to substitute it, I just substitute the prototile and then translate by phi of um, whatever t was translated by. Uh, and then if you want to translate, if you want to substitute an entire tiling, I don't know why I chose that weird q, um, but <laughs> for the substitution on the tiling, q is uh, just substitute all the tiles. And then it's going to be um, the same thing as it was in one dimension. If, it's in, if the tiling is invariant, you call it self-affine. Um, and super tiles are anything of the form s to the n of one of the tiles. All right. And I, whoops, did I? Ah, OK, so <laughs> I, found this, I found this tiling on the Tiling Encyclopedia. Do you guys know about the Tiling Encyclopedia? It's cool. Um, you can look it up. They've just got a zillion uh, mostly substitution tilings on there. This one is from Ludwig Danzer, um, and it's called T2000. I'm not sure why, but it sounds really modern, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> And so you've got a little blue triangle and a, big blue, and a big yellow triangle plus a bunch of rotations of them. And the little blue triangle gets subs inflated by a factor of three, right? It's, this is a self-similar tiling. So the linear map is just three times the identity. Um, and uh, the blue tile substituted by that. The yellow tile substituted by that. All the rotations, you just rotate the, the super tiles. Um, so here's a one super tile. If you go around again, you get that one. And I thought I would show you a cool picture. I think that one's really quite pretty. Um, okay, so uh, that's self-similar tilings. Um, so you have a linear map. You blow up the tiles, and they land perfectly on top of patches. Um, so what can I, are there any questions before I move to pseudo self-similar tilings? All right. So um, all right, so pseudo self-similar tilings. Remember at the beginning of yesterday's talk, I showed you uh, the Penrose inflation. So it's pseudo self-similar in the sense that, yes, there's an expanding linear map. Yes, the expanded tiles sit on top of patches. But no, they don't sit on there perfectly, but still somehow everything fits. So OK, so first you have to, I need to say what I mean by expanding a tiling by a linear map. It's, it's a technical point. I just take every tile and blow it up by a factor of phi and keep the label the same. So essentially, I'm just making a big tiling, like I showed you in that picture of the one-dimensional ones. Um, so if I blow up a whole tiling, it's just um, the union of the blow up of all the tiles. Um, and so technically speaking, this tiling is made using the prototile set that's all the expanded tiles. 
Okay, so essentially the way that a um, pseudo self affine or pseudo self similar, um, oh, so this should say affine, it's only a phase of similarity that it would be similar, um, but it's pseudo self similar if when you blow up T, it's locally derivable from, phi, uh, from, from itself from phi of t. So you have the tiling of the big tiles, and you can locally determine what should be at um, each location in the original tiling. So pseudo means fake. <laughs> You're not, that wasn't your question. Because it doesn't fit right. Yeah, because it doesn't fit right. And it's really, again, somewhat regrettable terminology, maybe. Uh, <laughs> um, but OK, so, so I made up an example. Um, this is based on something in Thurston's. There's this old, I have this old bootleg copy of, Thurst, of Thurston's lecture notes um, from when he kind of, I mean, I guess he kind of introduced self-similar tilings to the general public, although I think they'd been brewing for a while. But he's got an example that's like this, but his tiling is periodic. I put colors on, so I, there's blue hexagon and a green hexagon. And this is your expanding linear map, and it's a similarity. Um, and it puts a little rotation in there. And so I've put the origin, I've just put dots so that you can keep track of where the origin is. Um, so you, you inflate by your linear map, and then I decided that um, the blue one will be replaced by this patch, and that the green one would be replaced by this patch of all blue ones. Um, and I, I thought I would show you just them overlaid, right? So the, this is an expanded blue tile. It's a little hard to see, but this is the expanded blue hexagon, and this is how it should lay atop its patch. And this is the expanded green hexagon, and that's how it should lay atop its patch. <clears throat> and there's, so there's, and it fits. Um, and there's the, the two super tile and the three super tile. And um, the origin, if you want, let me go back for a sec. If you want to have the origin right there, then you'll notice that this blue tile is fixed, right? So um, that can help you be oriented in this picture. So if you look, if the origin was right there, then you can see this is, this, this is the substitution of one of the tiles. And, um, and then the, the green tile got the, the all blue. And then if you go around again, you get this. Oh, where's my... You could, you could. Right, so one of you uh, noticed that you could make this into a tile with a fractal boundary and then it would be a self-similar tiling and that's, that's true. Um, and that's often true. Um, although it's not clear. <laughs> Am I gonna be able to get the class back to order? It probably doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> that's all right. You don't have to listen to me. Um, fusion rules. OK, so this is um, Lorenzo Sedun and I originally sort of introduced this as a, as a way to try to generalize the idea of non-constant length substitutions. Because in a sense, the, the, um, the linear map sort of provides a constant length 
aspect to things uh, that I would like to not have to necessarily adhere to. And so we came up with, uh, <laughs> oh right, is that, okay, I'm not going to say, uh, there's really not really actually 389 slides. I'm just gonna say 389 sentences and that's not so bad, right? Um, okay, so fusion is, um, <laughs> I'm in preview now, that's why it's doing that. I, I don't know how to make it not do that. Um, okay, so fusion is just concatenation for patches. Um, so if you have two patches that you can stick together um, so that they don't overlap and their support is a, uh, a connected set, then you've got yourself a fusion of two patches. Um, okay, so here's how you make a fusion rule. So you start with your prototiles. Um, those are your zero super tiles. Um, and I like to think of them as sort of an atomic model. So the inflate and subdivide rules are almost like a cellular model, um, where a tile is like a cell that grows, and when it's big enough, it splits, right? This is different. The tiles are like at atoms, and you stick them together to form larger and larger structures. So the one super tiles you could think of as like molecules in this analogy, and they're just any finite collection of patches of prototiles. Um, so fusions of individual tiles. All right, so uh, there are no rules on how many elements of P1 there are. There might be more or less than however many there were in P0. It doesn't matter. You just, they just, the only rule is they have to be fusions of zero super tiles, that's all. Um, the two super tiles are a finite collection, which I call P2 of patches um, that are fusions of one super tiles. So you just stick them together and, and grow larger and larger structures. So the N super tiles is just a set of patches that have been made from N minus one super tiles. And at each stage, you can change the number of patches, you can change the combinatorics, you can change a lot of things, or you can keep it the same. Um, so this, this situation does include self-similar tiling, self-affine tilings. It includes everything. <clears throat> it includes a little too much, but. <clears throat> okay, so the notation that I've used um, the, these are the N super tiles. And I'm using that script P that I was using for prototiles because sometimes you want to think of the N super tiles as being the prototiles for a larger tiling. Um, and there's just however many there are, P, there's uh, J sub N of them, however many that is. Um, if you, I'll just throw away another comment. If you happen to know about Bradley diagrams, uh, this fits in that paradigm as well, non-stationary Bradley diagrams. Um, okay, so, um, so you can think of your N super tiles as patches of N minus one super tiles or of, of super tiles at any lower level, really, if you want to. Um, and so you put all the super tiles together um, in this big, huge atlas that I'm calling R, and that's your fusion rule. And you're using it as, an, as a language to create the tilings. Yeah? Why do you have only finitely many N Well, you could have infinitely many if you wanted, but like we usually restrict to a finite prototile set, um, and for this, and, and the super tiles, you kind of treat them like prototiles, but just at a higher level. And so we tend to want them to be, so the results that are, results you can get that are analogous to the substitution case and the self-similar case tend to have finite prototile or super tile sets. Yeah. You have only finite many prototypes, but then you allow to just glue them together as long as the union is connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you could, you could do what you're saying, you could. I'm just not because the results that we have are for this situation. 
Okay, but then I don't understand what are the super effects. So you're going to fix whatever. Um, so in the, if you imagine um, the hexagon case I just showed, right? So the two super tiles, there were just two of them. And the, the three super tiles, there were also just, hmm? You fix a finite sub-collection. Yes. Okay. However you want. And it's just that the geometry does not have to be related to the geometry at the previous levels, except that it has to be a fusion of patches from the previous levels. But they don't have to resemble in shape the previous ones at all. All right, so you make this atlas that has all the patches in it, um, all the super tiles in it, and then you're just gonna, um, do the same thing we've been doing, just let, our, let a, tiling, a tiling be called admitted by the fusion rule if all of its patches um, can be found somewhere in a super tile of some level. Um, and then you get yourself a tiling space that's the set of all tilings admitted by um, the fusion rule. And that is going to be closed, it's going to be translation invariant, and those are things that you can verify. But let's, all right, so let's do an example. The best, the best examples, the easiest examples to write down are direct products and direct product variations. Um, so let's do a direct product. So I just picked out this substitution here, so A goes to A, B, B, and B goes to A, and I'm gonna use that to create a fusion rule. Okay, so I'm gonna take the direct product of the alphabet, so I'm gonna end up with these four um, tile types. Right now it's gonna be symbolic. Um, we can make it geometric if we want to, but for now these will be, um, and what I'm gonna do is, is in the first coordinate I'll have the substitution run horizontal, and in the second coordinate I'll have the substitution run vertical. So you end up with this. Um, so if you just focus your eyeballs on the A, the substitution of AA, then this first A, so you see ABB in the first coordinate going horizontally and ABB, ABB. And then the second A, that's going vertical, ABB. And so, they come out with different shapes, right? Because the original thing was not um, constant length. I'm just giving you a moment to squint at it. <laughs> um, all right, so clearly we would prefer to see this in tilings, and so we'll be doing that momentarily but people are still squinting at this, so I'm going to let them continue to squint. <laughs> All right, so, so this is, I, I, if you want, it's much, much nicer to see the letters as uh, just colored squares. Um, and if you do that, the direct product uh, looks like this. So this is the AA tile, and if you go back, I'll go back for a sec. Notice there's just the one AA, it's just in this lower corner. You've got these four BBs here, and then if you um, come forward, you see the four BBs and the one AA. All right. Um, and all right, so, so look. This is my, these are my zero super tiles, right? My proto tiles, and it's true, I've got four. Um, and so this, this example is gonna be um, what I call a stationary fusion. Um, I'm gonna do everything the same at each level, so it's, it's as close to a non-constant length substitution as you can get. I'm not gonna change the number of tiles per level. I'm not gonna change anything level by level except 
um, to concatenate. So this is, this is certainly the concatenation of a bunch of zero super tiles, right? All right, so if I want to continue, because I'm making this rule stationary, I can kind of make up this sort of schematic diagram um, that's telling me if I want to make the n plus 1 tile of the first type, I'm going to take the n super tile of the type A, and I'm going to concatenate them all together like this. Is it clear that it will be consistent? You can make the argument that it will be consistent as follows. Um, so basically, this uh, you can say what the height is. And this guy is only ever next to this guy, and so they'll have the same height. And then you can make the same argument for all the other dimensions. So I'll show you one in a sec where it will not be clear, but you can still make the argument. Um, um, so when you're doing a direct product, just a literal direct product, it's made for you. But we're going to vary it in a second, and then you have to be careful. So maybe you can ask again. Um, OK, so if I take this schematic as my, this is going to be how I stick it together every level. So this is sort of, because it's stationary, I can do this. Um, and so the two super tiles come out to be this. They just do. Um, and you can see it, right? This, is, this was the substitution of the A, A tile, and then there were four B, B tiles, and you can see them right there, and so on. So it's all, it's all as it should be. And this is in your, um, this, this example's in the lecture notes, so you can stare at it. It's not in color in the lecture notes, but that's okay because Colors don't add that much, except prettiness. Um, OK, so the thing about the Z2 diet, so I was, I was doing these direct products back in the day because I wanted to make, uh, I'd been reading Boris's paper on the dynamics of self-similar tilings, and I knew that it depended on the, um, the um, the expansion factor would determine whether the tiling system was mixing, a weekly mixing or not. And so I wanted to make, I felt like there weren't enough examples of weekly mixing tilings in the world. And so I thought, oh, I'll just, you know, write down uh, one, I'll just write down a direct product that I know to be, that has a non piso fact, expansion factor, and I'll take a direct product and I'll have a weekly mixing. Um, and it turns out that's true. But it's harder than I thought. Um, but anyway, so if you're just taking the direct product, though, it's just the, you just already know the dynamics. It's just the direct product of the one-dimensional systems. Um, but if you're careful, you can break the direct product structure. So that's what we're going to do to make a direct product variation. Um, and you just have to be careful and it, you know, to make the argument that it's going to fit. But it will fit. So I figured it would probably be best if I showed you the direct product again. And then these three, I'm going to leave the same. And this one, I'm just going to vary this little corner. I'm going to do a flip. I'm basically going to flip across the diagonal on both sides. And that little maneuver pretty much always works. <laughs> it, it's going to fit. When you iterate it, it's going to fit. Um, that little maneuver just pretty much always works. And so this is my new fusion rule. This is my DPV fusion rule. Um, and I made a little schematic for it. And you can see in my schematic, um, because the A tile is bigger, right, when you, when you substitute it. So I just drew it in the schematic a little bigger. There's nothing exact here. These aren't supposed to look like um, that's not really supposed to represent the actual sizes. They're just supposed to tell you the combinatorics of how you want to put them together. And if you uh, make the two super tiles, then they just come out to be this. Um, so I don't know, maybe point your eyeballs at this big A super tile in the middle. You can see it right here. 
This is where I did the little flip right in that little area. Um, and so even though I left three of them the same, this looks pretty different than the other one. And I think in my next slide, I've got a sort of a compare and contrast between the DP and the DPV. So if you make a direct product substitution, um, they always sort of look like, um, you know, like plaid, like tartan, like Scottish. That's what they, they always look like that to me. Um, and, uh, and then you can really see that that, so you can really see that it's a direct product somehow. And, um, and this, we've completely broken the direct product structure even though we only varied just those four tiles. All right, and so, And so you can ask the question, what, how do you know it's always going to fit? Well, the thing is the fusion paradigm doesn't require you, the fusion paradigm requires you to have patches at each level for the unsuper tiles. And here we have that. Um, at each level, you get the four super tiles. And that's all you need. All right, so, um, okay, so there's a problem with this one. So you probably, you cannot see this tiling, this particular DPV, because its expansion factor is not piezo, um, you can't actually see it as a substitution. Because here's what, here's what goes wrong. What goes wrong is that if you have two tiles that are adjacent, then you know what you're gonna substitute them with, right? You already have the rule. Um, so you know what an, what an AA looks like when you, when you blow it up. But um, two tiles that are adjacent, you have no idea what their relationship is going to be to one another after the whole thing has been expanded. So concatenation it loses its meaning in the non piezo situation. So I, I took a sort of a random portion of a large piece of this and just, uh, I, will, I will tell you, and you can think I, I, I've, I've written on this subject before, um, you, you will have these lines, and I'm not sure where they are in this picture because I really just am not totally sure where we are in the tiling, but you will have these fault lines along which you'll have two tiles. I'll just point at these two and pretend. You'll have two tiles that are close to each other, but when you go to substitute them, um, their individual one super tiles are arbitrarily far away from each other. They can be arbitrarily far away, yeah. And um, and um, and it comes from the non piso, right? It's sort of the same reason when you go when you make the broken line and it goes arbitrarily far away. Um, so. Um, so with, but there's no problem with the fusion rule because with the fusion rule, you're not substituting individual tiles, right? You're just taking big and super tiles and you're sticking them together using that template that I showed you. You don't have to worry about the ticky tack little small pieces. They just come along for the ride. Um, but you, you can't think of this guy as a substitution um, even though it really feels like you could. So, so in, a, in a very real sense, this is different than a substitution rule. All right, so that, and uh, so there's another kind of fusion rule. So this, that last one was an example of it, uh, something I call an algorithmic fusion rule. So with the last one, I could draw a little schematic to show you where everything should go. I can't draw a schematic for this one, but I can write an algorithm for it. Um, 
And so this is a, it's, I got this, I don't know, like a decade ago, I got this out of some paper by Tomas Fernique, who's not paying any attention. Hi, Tomas. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, and um, so, in this, so I'm just giving you an example. I don't even know how I would define this other than I can write an algorithm for it. And as you can, if it's not clear to you yet, I'm really not a theoretical computer scientist. But um, so <laughs> you input n super tiles that you get from somewhere, usually the previous level. And you input some kind of fundamental, in this example, just translations. But maybe you input some kind of fundamental isometries of some sort. Um, <clears throat> and in this case, I have a piece of uh, information that's fixed. It's this, um, this matrix here. And the outputs are n plus 1 super tiles and n plus 1 versions of the fundamental translation vectors. Oh, this should, these should say n plus 1, but whatever. All right, so and here's the actual rule. So this is called the uniform shape substitution. I, I don't think they ever really took off exactly, but um, they are fusion rules. Um, so at the n plus first level, the a tile will be replaced by, by this guy. So one a tile and then a b tile translated by this much and a b tile translated by that much. The B is sort of the same thing with the BAA. I, I made this one bijective. I don't know what that means because I just made it up recently and I haven't analyzed it. And you update the translation vectors, just get multiplied by this matrix. So there's a little sort of rotation, not in the tiles themselves, but in where they get put. Um, I think this comes out of, well, we'll talk about that at some other point. So you, to run the algorithm, you just put in a prototile set and see if it and some initial vectors and, and see if it tiles. And I know of at least three distinct shapes that, that this algorithm will accept and make tilings from. It'll make it from hexagons, which I'm going to show you. It makes it from squares, which is what's in the lecture notes. I had the hexagons in there, too, and then I got told that it was silly to have two examples of the same thing, so I took it out. Um, and then it also works with L triominoes, or like the little chairs. You can also do it with those. Um, OK, so I, uh, these are the hexagons. You can write down, this is like minus 1, 1. They're, they're in very <laughs> standard locations. And these are your initial translations. You put it in the rule. So the rule said that A1 should be an A a B translated by this much and a B translated by that much. And so the, these are what you get. You definitely see the bijectivity. And I put a little dot in there so you could keep track of where the origin is again. Um, OK, so here is uh, the first six super tiles of whatever the A type, I guess. Um, all right, first off. All the hexagons are the same size in this picture. They're just, each image has been rescaled so that they fit in the picture together. But OK, so you see this, the three. OK, so I have to replace this guy. That's the same. That's where it was. And then my updated translation vectors say, put a B there and put a B there. Yes, there's a rotation. <laughs> I think it's always on the boundary. I think you need one or two more. But I'm not sure. I literally, I mean, I made this up like a decade ago and then didn't, well, I mean, I just was reading Tomas's paper and I just was like, oh, let me make one up. And so I made that up. And then I looked at it when I was writing these notes and made this, made these images and thought maybe I should think about this thing some more because it's cool. And it's also bijective, which means it should have non-trivial spectrum. Um, but anyway, you, you see, do you understand the, um, the general 
So, you know, I'll have three of these that I need to stick together so one of them is invariant and the other two get stuck there and there, and at the next phase they get stuck there and there. And you see why I couldn't really quite draw a schematic, I couldn't figure out how to draw a schematic for it because they're moving every time, even though the tiles themselves are not rotating, but the super tiles somehow are. Um, and it certainly appears that they're approaching a limiting shape in sort of the same way that the hexagon one was. Um, and so I, I think this is probably ultimately uh, pseudo self-similar, and that's fine, but it's, it's just a cool, cool example. All right, and I, and I figured I'd show you one. I mean, this is really sort of S-adic. Um, but here's a fusion rule where again I'm keeping it, I'm keeping it so that there's just two prototiles or just two super tile types each time, but I'm gonna change the rule at every level and I'm gonna end up with a space. I'm not gonna attempt to justify this, but I'm gonna end up with a space that's minimal but has two ergodic measures, one that's gonna be A heavy and one that's gonna be B heavy. Um, so the one super tiles, you put 10 A's and then a B or 10 Bs and then an A, and then at the next level you're going to put 100 P1 of A and 1 P1 of B, um, and the reverse for the two super tiles of type B. So clearly there's a lot more of these guys. It's, it's growing very quickly um, at the next level. So this is the 10 to the N example. I think you'll be shocked to see that the number of Super tiles is that, and so if you if you do the math on this, you'll see that um, it is as I say. But I'm not going to try to justify that. But um, so this gives you a little bit of a of an example of of the kinds of things you can make happen with fusion rules. Um, and speaking of S attic, I, I promised that I would tell you um, why S attic sequences are, 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 are fusions. Um, Right, so the definitions that I'm about to put are slightly different than Jurg's definitions. Um, I took them straight out of Valerie Berthe and, um, and Delacroix's uh, paper. Um, so the way that it works in that paper, so it's like pretty general. Um, you have actually a countable family of finite alphabets and you're gonna make a substitution that takes you from each alphabet to the one before it, to words on the one before it. That's, that's, that's them's, them's the rules. Um, and then you, um, so then, then you say, okay, well, is this sequence asiatic? Um, oh, is that the direct? sequence. Um, is that the directive sequence? Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm not totally fluent. Um, all right, so uh, let's see here. So um, you, you an infinite word just going off to the right admits an asiatic expansion if it looks like the limit of these guys, which this is what Jörg had, uh, but he was using the same alphabet at each stage, I think, but you can just change alphabets. Um, and that's not, not a big deal. Okay, so there are fusions, and here's why. Um, all right, so the prototile set is A0. If you think about it, when you're done with this whole, when you're done with this whole string of substitutions, the last one you apply is sigma naught, and that takes your A1 alphabet to your A0 alphabet. So um, for sure, X is a sequence on A naught. 
Um, okay, so your prototile set's gonna be A naught. The one super tiles are just, um, are just uh, whatever your substitution said it should be. It's just patches of A naught tiles that have been prescribed by whatever your substitution is. Um, so that's fine. And then the two super tiles are fusions of one super tiles as follows. They look like this. So A is an A2. So sigma 1A is a, a sequence of letters in A1. And so um, sigma 1 of A is a word in A1. Um, and so when we apply sigma naught to it, it looks like a fusion of one super tiles, just like it's supposed to. It's like I keep getting turned around on this, but it's definitely true. And if you do it, it for, if you just sort of translate that argument to the, the higher level, I, um, you, you, um, you can see your n super tiles as a fusion of n minus one super tiles in whatever order this guy told you to put it in. So, so Lorenzo and I, I don't know if this is useful to any of you. Lorenzo and I wrote a paper on fusion rules. Um, we figure out how the ergodic measures work. We figure out uh, a lot of facts about mixing with sort of the analogs of the normal results that one would have for tilings and also for sequences. So if you need a quick, like, here's the ergodic measure or something, and you're doing aseotic stuff, you can refer to that paper, and it's just, um, it's already done for you. <laughs> so, okay, so let's see here. Dynamics of super tile construct, uh, should I maybe, Wait, I should ask you because you're in charge. Should I keep going or should I? I can go a few more minutes. Okay, so maybe I'll talk a little bit about dynamics of super tile constructions. Um, unless anyone wants to talk at all further about s -attic or anything. So I'm done with cool pictures. Yeah? So uh, you said that s constructions are fusion, but why uh, fusions are not s so why is it not the case that we have a finite vector? And it's one dimensional. Yeah. Okay. And symbolic. <laughs> yeah, but okay, but if you, if you are fusions uh, two dimensional equivalent of SLE constructions. Um, they might be. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you would think of them that way, yeah. So I, that's not something I thought of when I was imagining how these would work, but they're, they're really like, they're also very closely related to cut and stack constructions, if that's a thing for you. Um, so, so it's not, yeah, there's some dispute as to just how different they are. But anyway, there they are. I wrote a paper on them, and that's what we got. Um, and I like them. Okay, so I, there is actually one more. There's, the picture I thought I put earlier is coming up <laughs> soon. All right, so let's see here. Um, all right, we already went through... So every single thing I just showed you is, is in a class of things I'm calling supertile methods for constructing things. Um, and I'm not sure whether that is regrettable terminology. If you have a better idea, let me know. But just as a class, they kind of all do the same thing, right? And they have a lot of things in common. There are, there are techniques that apply to all of them. OK, so there's two ways. As usual, there's two ways to make tiling spaces. Um, from the super tile methods. So one way is to take the set of all super tiles, use it as a language, take everything that's allowed, and make your tiling space that way. And that always works. Um, in the self-similar tiling case, pseudo-self-similar and substitution type cases, you can get an invariant tiling, a tiling that's invariant under the substitution in some way. And then you can make the hull. Uh, so that doesn't always work, but it's a nice, 
it's a nice construction and people like to think of it that way. Um, most of the time, it doesn't matter which way you do it because you're going to get the same space. So if the word primitivity means something to you, most of the time, if your substitution is primitive and you've started with a reasonable invariant tiling, you'll get um, the language version anyway. But in any case, I'm just going to use omega. Um, the details of when they're not the same, maybe we'll get into that, maybe we won't. I said a little about it in the lecture notes. Um, Oh, yeah, right. So some super tile rules don't uh, admit any tiling. So I think of a fusion rule. You could, if you're in two dimensions, you could make a fusion rule that just always got arbitrarily long and skinny and never made a tiling of the whole plane. We're just going to ignore any fusion rules that act like that. Um, OK, so maybe I will attempt to describe recognizability and then stop. Um, so. The idea behind recognizability is, suppose you're in a tiling that has been made by some kind of super tile technique. Um, and when I say tiling, I might mean sequence. They all sort of act very similarly. Um, so if I'm in one of these tilings and I'm standing at a certain tile or symbol, um, it's the, 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 the super tile technique is recognizable if I can tell from my immediate surroundings what kind of super tile I'm in, unambiguously. So there isn't, a, there isn't two possible choices of what kind of super tile I'm in. OK, so um, of course, every tile in any tile in any tiling will be in n super tiles of every level because of the way the space has been defined. Um, so I know for a fact that I'm always in n super tiles of all levels, um, but they might not all be unique, like I said. Um, but you can always think of. T as being composed of n super tiles instead of ordinary tiles. And so you can uh, use the notation T sub n to, to mean the tiling T except uh, thought of as having been constructed out of n super tiles as opposed to original super tiles. So if I'm in T sub n, I can break it up down into prototiles and see um, and so I'm calling that an n super tiling for t. And of course, there will be countably many, one for each n, uh, at least. Whoops. That was the, all right. And so uh, the space of all n super tilings is denoted uh, omega sub n. So omega sub n is um, the tiling space made of the version of each tiling that's in omega, except um, using the n super tiles as the prototile set. All right, so um, so just for the heck of this is this is the picture I thought I had up before, because this would have been a good one for me to show you when I was showing you the definition of pseudo self-similar, because see, so here, um, these are three super. These are the same three super tile, and here I've uh, I've expanded the original tiling um, and shown the expanded tiles on top. Remember, I, I I gave a definition of what it means to have an expanded tiling, and so the colors look weird. But here you see the three. Um, the colors are hard to see, but these are all one super tile. So this would be T sub 1. This would be the 1 super tiling. And then this would be the 2 super tiling. The, uh, I mean the large, with the enlarged tiles is the super tiling. And this one, it's a little bit easier to see. You can see that this would have been a blue tile, and this would have been a green tile. So these ones are. 
Is this super tiling idea making sense? Yeah. Right, so of course, you can always go from the n super tiles to the n minus 1 super tiles and down, all the way down um, to the prototiles unambiguously. But the question of whether you can go backwards is what recognizability is about. Um, so one way to define recognizability is a sort of global definition which says that a super tile rule is recognizable if when you go... Um, when you go from the n super tiles to the n minus 1 super tiles, it's possible to go back. Um, but the way that you think about it is more local than that. I'm standing in my tiling. I look around at my n super tiles around me, and I go, oh, well, then I should draw this n plus 1 super tile. Um, OK. You know what? Let's say it's good enough for today. Because <laughs> I have one more, one more lecture. So you'll learn all about those next time, and you already know a little about them because they've been brought up. But that's all for me. Yes, sir. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still puzzled uh, a little bit between uh, about the difference between um, fusion and um, esotic. And maybe can you go back to dimension one? Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled by esotic by itself. <laughs> because, puzzled by esotic by yes, itself? Beca by, because in, in this article you mentioned um, by Berthe and uh, Vincent Delacroix, when they set it, I recently looked at it, that's why I know it. Uh, when they set it up, they, they don't they don't require the set of substitutions given to define it. But then right. later in the article, I think they, they, later in the article, they, I think they sort of assume it's finite. So, so do, you mean, do you mean it to be finite in your sense? And no. No? I don't. So my guess is, because this is also true with fusion rules, um, and I don't know all the results in that paper, so I, you know, maybe ask Neither Jörg. You, you have to... <laughs> You can be the expert on essay attic. Um, but I know that, I mean, without imposing further rules on what substitutions you use, you can basically get anything. So you could get the full, um, I'm pretty sure you could get the full shift space um, as an essay attic, because I know you could get the full tiling space as a fusion. Um, you just allow ridiculously many super tiles and the growth is, is, is very large. Um, and so usually you will make some restriction like let's have a finite number of, of substitutions, let's have the you know, prototile sets be bounded, something like this to make it so that, um, that you can actually say get some results. So what's the difference then between fusion and esotic, or is it the same? Well, this is, yes, yeah, so Emmanuel was asking a, a, a similar question. Well, I mean, so esotic is specific to the one-dimensional symbolic case. Um, and that's really pretty much it. OK, OK. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Given the sequence of fusion rule, how do you know that they tile, that they tile the space? Right. So you don't. So there's nothing in the definition that promises that you can that it's going to work. Um, so the question of does a given fusion rule actually admit um, tile, infinite tilings of the plane? I have no results on that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. For the final uh, recognizability pro uh, problem, so if you uh, probably you can make some example which is not periodic but not recognizable. 
for fusion. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. That's true. So, um, so there are famous results for substitutions and for self-similar tilings that non-periodicity non implies recognizability, but you can make an example that shows that for fusion rules, that is not the case. Um, and it's in Lorenzo and I have it in our paper. Okay, so yeah, there was a question. Did you get?